So, uh, as Laura said, Habitat Caller um, is tasked with maximum sensitivity. Uh, we want to make sure that every variant or every possibility of a variant is emitted by uh, Habitat Caller. And then the um, idea that we, that we use is uh, very sensitive calling and then filtering separately. And the, one of the reasons is that um, different people have different use cases and a clinical use case could be very, very different than a research use case. Uh, so we've had, you know, different groups say, oh, you know, a false positive is a lot more expensive to us than a false negative. And then other groups say, oh, no, a false negative is much more expensive to us than a false positive. And depending on where you lie on that spectrum between the cost of false positives and false negatives, you might want to filter differently. Um, so here we are in the map. We have our raw variants, they're unfiltered, and now we want to filter them. And it should be clear that filtering happens at the variant level, meaning every row of that VCF is either going to be filtered or not filtered. And so you can't have a scenario where for one sample, you're going to say, oh, that one sample in that variant, one genotype is okay, but another genotype is not okay. That's not how we operate in this uh, in this scenario, we filter either a variant we think is bogus and we filter it out, or we say, nope, this variant is okay and we leave it in. It's not quite as simple, but that's how you should think of it in the beginning. So, um, in general, there are two filtering approaches. One is uh, an approach by hard filters. So, there are various annotations that are put in to the variants that we haven't quite talked about. We'll talk about them in a second. Uh, and you could, so there are a bunch of numbers that are associated with the variants. Um, and you could devise uh, hard filtering. So for example, just an example, we have a quality score to a variant and someone might think that they could filter variants based on their quality, right? That would be a hard filter. If your quality is greater than 30, then it's good. And if it's less than 30, then it's bad. That's an example of a hard filter. It's not a very good one, but it's an example. Um, um, we use a different uh, approach, what we call variant uh, recalibration, that uses machine learning. Um, and the reason for that is that you have to look at the numbers in context of your call set. The numbers don't mean the same thing when your, con when your, um, when your call set is large and when your call set is small. And so, you, you don't know in advance what cutoffs to use. Not only that, it's hard to devise cutoffs in a meaningful way. Sometimes the regions in the high dimensional space of annotations that you want to keep is not quite as square as you could define with re easy uh, hard filters. So you want something a little bit more flexible than that. Right. So, Habitat caller, in addition to making a call, in addition to making this record that says position 22 at this, I mean chromosome 22 at this position uh, with this ID, which here is not mentioned, this reference allele, this variant allele, um, and this quality, it also gives us some information about the variant. What is the allele count? What's the allele frequency? How many chromosomes were actually found, in this case six, uh, what was the total depth, and so on. And these numbers are, some of these numbers are numbers that we're going to be using as annotations. These are statistics that were calculated on the reads while, or on the, on the variant while Habitat Caller was looking at it. Right? So in addition to making the call, Habitat Caller was also collecting some statistics. For example, um, one of these, SB, strand balance, tells you whether the reads were all found on one strand and not, on, the reads that for the variants were all found on uh, one strand versus 
uh, the reference that was found on both strands. And so that would start indicating that there might be some technical issue, right? If all of your variants show up only on one strand, but your non-variants show up on both strands, then you might ask yourself the question, why is that, if it's a real piece of DNA from, from someone's, someone, from, from, from cells, then there shouldn't be a difference between the strands, between the variants and the non-variants. Um, that's just an example of, uh, of what an annotation, what, what I mean by statistics. Um, okay. So um, here is an example of many variants that came from a call set. And we've plotted two, uh, two of the annotations, it doesn't really matter which, two of the annotations um, on the x and the y axes. And you can see that there's some sort of, there's some sort of structure here, but it's not entirely clear what this data is trying to tell you, right? Maybe this is good and this is bad. Maybe this and this are good and this is bad. It's not entirely clear which of these variants are good. Maybe they're all good. Maybe they're all bad. It's kind of hard to tell. So one thing you can do is you can um, look at this with, well, this is already the result. Um, actually, if you, if you look at this and you color it by what VQSR, what the variant quality recalibration thinks, you see that it already has some opinion. So these are different filters, and it has decided that these are bad, really bad, the purple ones. The blue ones are a little better, but still bad. The green ones are even better, but still would be filtered. And then the, blue, the red ones are packed. And so it broke this space into what we call tranches, going from the best to the worst, um, where your sensitivity will increase as you take more and more of the bad stuff, but your specificity, your false positive rate, will uh, also increase. Your specificity will decrease. Your false positive rate will increase. So how do we get such a discrimination between the different variants? Um, first of all, the model that we build for this uh, is, is called the Gaussian uh, model. So we assume that um, we assume that the variants come from these Gaussian-shaped clusters in our annotation space, our high-dimensional, you know, eight, seven or eight-dimensional annotation space, and we build a mixture model of several Gaussians, um, several Gaussians for the good stuff, several Gaussians for the bad stuff. We train that model, and then when we have a, um, a variant, we evaluate it against the good model, we evaluate it against the bad model, and then we can give a relative score, how much of it is good, how much of it is bad, and the ratio between those two numbers gives us this score, and then we, uh, that's how we sort the different variants. Okay. Um, but how do we generate these models? Well, before we, how we generate these models, I'll explain exactly what I mean by, um, by the scoring. So imagine that we only had one dimension. It's very difficult to make slides for seven dimensions. So we'll pretend that we just have one dimension. And we only, not only that, we have one dimension, and we just have, our models are very simple. We have one Gaussian for the good stuff, one Gaussian for the bad stuff, and that's it. Okay, so this is how we are, this is the uh, cartoon of reality that we're using right now. And so this is the model here of the of the good variant and this is the model of the bad variant and our variant that we're trying to evaluate right now happens to land here okay somewhere between good and bad right so we evaluate its score we just evaluate that function that gaussian we evaluate it here for the good and for the bad and we get two numbers p and q and then the ratio of these two numbers the, the log of the ratio is called the log odd that's the score of that variant. So that's just a number. You get that number. And basically, if you look at all your variants, the, the highest scoring variant is the one that we think is the best, and the lowest scoring variant is the one we think is the worst. And theoretically, you could cut your data set according to that score anywhere you want and get a different set of filtered versus non-filtered variants. Right? And so uh, in this simple scenario, that would look something like moving this line here. 
Of course, when you have multiple Gaussians in multiple dimensions, then it's not that simple. But in this scenario, even in this scenario, it's not entirely true, but we'll pretend that um, um, in this scenario, it's as if we have this threshold that we're moving it here. So in some sense, it looks like a hard filtering, but it's hard. It's, it's not really because this is a caricature. All right. Um, so it says here, this is, this is not entirely true. It says here, done for each annotation and then integrated into a single overall uh, VQS uh, load score. That's not entirely true. Um, the way one should think of this is that each, the, the, the true model, there's, two, there's always going to be two models, the true and the false, right? The true model is instead of being made out of one Gaussian like it is here, is made out of several Gaussians. So imagine you have you know, a hill over here and a hill over here and a hill over there. That's the true model, right? And the false model as well. There's several different Gaussians that represent the, the false model. And these models, instead of being one dimensional like here, are multiple dimensional, right? Because we're going to choose several different annotations. So you have these weird Gaussian shaped things in multiple dimensions, if you could imagine that in your head, right? So you have this multi dimensional function for the false and the multi dimensional function for the true. You evaluate it for your new variant, because your new variant has a coordinate, just like this, has a coordinate in each one of those dimensions. You get a number, you get two numbers, one from the true, one from the false. You still calculate that number. Okay, so this is what VQSR is doing under the scenes. Of course, you don't have to do any of that, you just get the number. All right, so here are, this is in, before we did it in 1D, now we can do it in 2D. 3D, I'm not going to have a plot for you. So, so here's how it looks. Here's an example in, in 2D. So here we have uh, what we call um, QD, quality over depth. And here we have SB, strand bias, the one I talked about before. And so in those two dimensions, we actually run it in seven dimensions. But in those two dimensions, we can see that it indeed looks like there is maybe a Gaussian here, might be a slightly bigger Gaussian around it. Same here, tight Gaussian here, slightly wider Gaussian around it, right? And then there's something going on here. Right? So that's our that's our uh, that's our that's the space that we're working in. And if we look at um, if we, so, these are these are there's. The yellow stuff is actually coming from uh, DB snip. Uh, so there's yellow things here. You can kind of see their shimmer under the red. But the yellow ones here are alone. Right? So it's actually likely that all this stuff is errors. DB snip has a lot of errors. So these are probably errors. And then this is probably the good stuff. And so we build the model by putting a bad model around DB snip, or at least the DB snip part that is separated from our variant. We put some Gaussians over our variants, and then we have our two models back. Does that make sense? All right. So then after we look at this plot, we can look at this plot, and this is their actual score. And so now you can see we ended up um, filtering these variants and retaining these variants. Um, so, okay, so we have a way to sort these different variants, but how do we decide where to place the threshold, right? So we've given all, each variant has a score now, that's great, that's one step forward. We've sorted them, but we need to choose a place on that list to say, okay, we're going to take these and we're going to throw away these, right? So how do we choose that place? So in order to choose that place, we take, we look at another truth set. We look at a truth set of things that are valid and we know that they're true and we're asking how many, of, and they're also common, and we ask how many of these, what is our sensitivity to that truth set? How many of that truth set would we capture if we were to use this threshold, right? So now, in addition to having a threshold, we kind of calibrate the threshold, right? Each threshold value is associated with a sensitivity to the truth set. And we hope that the sensitivity to the truth set is somehow related to sensitivity to our data set, which is what we care about, because the truth set is already known. And we use the same sensitivity as a proxy for the sensitivity inside our column. So, um, 
I feel like I'm missing a slide, but okay. Uh, so the steps are we build the model and we apply it. So that means that we have a VCF that has the score. And then we, we uh, sorry, we, and then we actually rewrite the VCF choosing a particular value as our filter. In order to do that, we can look at the different tranches, the different tranches that come out automatically from our uh, filtering step, and it will tell us there's uh, you, normally three tranches that get calculated automatically. What is the sensitivity of each one? And then you can choose which one you want to work with. Or you can choose a different sensitivity altogether if you are feeling up for it. Or you can just go with the default. That also works. And that's the step in apply recalibration. So in terms of the pipeline, SNPs and indels are dealt with differently. So we have to create two different, um, two different models. We create a model and apply it to the SNPs. We create a model and apply it to the variant, to the indels. And in the end, we get a recalibrated SNP and recalibrated indels um, in one VCF. So yeah, so you have to run, you basically have to run VQSR twice, once on SNPs and once on indels. Um, so again, to be clear, when you run, you start with the original VCF that is unfiltered. You add some resources that tell you what the truth sets are um, and, and um, all these files that you need in order to know how to build the model and how to create the sensitivity. That gives you the recalibration file and the tranches that you need in order to actually apply the recalibration. And then when you apply the recalibration, you take that original VCF file and the output from the variant recalibration, and you get the recalibrated VCF. And you do this twice, once for indels and once for SNPs. Um, here's, the, here's a outline of the command. So this is in GTK3. Um, we run the variant recalibrator giving it the reference, the input VCF, several resources that are too long to put on one slide, so we'll wait till the next slide for that. Here is the list of annotations that we uh, recommend using. Look at the actual documentation for the full uh, list. Here it says mode, SNP mode in this case. Um, which tranches, uh, where to put the recalibration file, this is output. Where to put the tranches file, this is output. And uh, there's an R script that you can point to if you want to generate those files. Okay, so what do we need in terms of uh, resources? We need to give it um, variants that overlap with the variants that we're using so that it could know that which, which of our variants are, should be considered true, good variants, right? So we need uh, truth for, uh, setting the, for setting the sensitivity. This is for the recalibration uh, later. And no, sorry, the known is for recalibration. The truth is for setting the actual the model, for knowing where the, uh, the true and the uh, false models are. The known are for setting the calibration. Yes? So when you're starting, starting with 100 variants? 100 variants? Yeah. Not even close. 1, 000, 10, 000, so we usually actually, um, the, the model will fail if you don't have enough. Uh, I mean, it will tell you that it couldn't find enough variants to build a model. Um, but we generally recommend working with around 50 samples of exome as minimum. Uh, so if you have a very small panel um, or in very few samples, this is not really going to be working for you. Uh, we have successfully run on one whole genome, but uh, we usually recommend using few more than one. Whole genome is easier in that regard. Um, so let me show you what the, um, right, so here are the resources. They are provided uh, in our resources file. So we need to tell it, uh, you don't need to write this down, but you need to tell it um, this is training, uh, and training and truth. So we use the HAP map for that. Uh, the Omni is also is, is used for training, but not as truth. 
um, 1,000 genomes is used as training but not as truth, and then the dbSNP is not used for training. Why? That's right, because it contains lots of errors. Someone was listening. Awesome. <laughs> That's why we do not use dbSNP for training. Um, but we do use it as known so that we can make plots with it, right? So we can kind of see what it's, what it's doing. Um, right, so dbSNP is, is not used for, for training. Um, um, all right, I feel like we've seen this a lot already. Okay, so here's uh, one of the, here's the output of the plot. Uh, this is um, from a while ago, but it's real outputs of plots. So you see, this is if you give it the this R script that I mentioned, that you'll get lots of plots that look like this coming out. So this is it's, it, because we don't know how to draw uh, in more than 2D. You'll get a lot of 2D plots, right? So for every combination of two dimensions, we compress the data onto those two dimensions. We plot the results, so you can see how they look. So this is uh, you know read position rank sum, which tells you basically whether all the variants, if the variant always happened at the end of the reads, that would be a bad read position rank sum, right? But if it, some reads have happened in the beginning and some reads have happened in the end and some reads have happened in the middle, then it's, then it's reasonable. Um, and so here you see the model uh, that we have. Green is high log score, meaning good. Negative four is, is, is red, is bad. So this is the good stuff is here and the bad stuff is here. And then, but that's the model, it has no variance in it. Now you can look at the variance. Uh, this explains the model, right? This was the positive training stuff. This was the stuff that we know was good to begin with. And these are variants that we didn't know anything about. So you can see that there's a separation between the variants that we knew something about and the variants that we didn't know anything about, which is why this model is built like it was. Because it was saying, oh, I see. The stuff that you say is good is over here. And then everything else is bad, so we'll just put it out. And then this is how um, our, our variants were actually filtered. So you see that it's not so simple, right? There's some stuff that's deep inside this model, or at least from this angle it looks like. It's inside this model, but it was still filtered. Because in some other dimension, it was sitting outside the model, right? You can only, we can only see in two dimensions here. So, so in this dimension, it looks like it's in the model. But if you had a way of visualizing this in seven dimensions, you would see that these points are actually outside. Um, and this is how dbSNP uh, behaves. Right? This is novelty, whether it was known or not known. So you see that uh, while some of dbSNP lives in here, much of, uh, many of the things that are outside were unknown, were not in dbSNP. So that's, a, a, again, a, a reassuring result. Uh, okay, so these are the tranches. This tranches plot shows you for each of the tranches that we allow. This is, uh, the number here is sensitivity. It's extremely counterintuitive. Usually, 100 is the best, right? If you get 100 on a score, that's the best. If you get 90, that's pretty good, but not like 100. 100 is better, right? Here, it's actually the opposite, because the number here is the sensitivity. So how can you get 100% sensitivity? What do you need to do to get 100% sensitivity? Include everything. When you include everything, what happens? You get lots of false positives, right? So this is the worst, right? Because it has everything. So include the bottom of the barrel as well, right? Everything. This, on the other hand, is the best. It only has stuff that we're absolutely sure of. On the other hand, it's losing a lot of sensitivity. It only has 90% sensitivity. Right? So these tells you, and you can see, uh, we'll talk more about that after the break, but the TATV ratio also shows that this is pretty good stuff here, and then it becomes quite terrible down here. Um, all right. So this kind of mirrors what I said. Uh, 100 is the worst, takes everything, and then you become more and more strict as you lower your sensitivity. All right, apply recalibration is a 
relatively boring step. You take the output of before, the recalibration file, you take your VCF, and you run it, and it basically copies over the value, the log scores that it found in the model, and sets a, a filter, uh, filter level. So you tell it what, what, uh, what level you want to use, what sensitivity you want to use. Okay, so how does it look on output? Before VCF, uh, before VQSR, we don't have, uh, we have the, well, we're missing some columns here. We have the chromosome and the position, and we should have the reference and the alternate alleles, and we have the, the name, and there's a few missing, but then we have the filter status. You see the filter status is empty. And we have all of our statistics that we're gonna build the model from. After VQSR, we also have a filter. The filter tells us whether it was filtered, if it was filtered in which tranche. So for example, this tranche here, 99.9 .9 to 100. Is that good or bad? Bad, that's the worst, right? And this one, 99.3 to 99.5, is that better than this one? Yes, it's better, but it's still not good. And then pass just means that it passed. Um, we also get some information about whether these variants were in our training or not. And, all, and, and what the actual VQS log was for that. Uh, if we do a hard filtered VCF, I don't know, we didn't even talk about how to do this. If we do have a hard filtered VCF, then it would look something like this. Uh, we would have a filter, but we would have no extra information. Because it's just hard filtered. All right. So, um, as was asked on exomes, it's hard to run VQSR on a few samples. We really recommend, here it says 30, I said 50. We run 50. When we, had, when we run on exomes, we usually try to have more than 50 exomes in a call set. If you don't have 50 in your experiment, um, ask, borrow, beg, steal some other samples and um, put them in. Of course, they have to be of a similar experiment, similar population. It have to be similar to what your experiment was, right? It's not gonna help you to take a completely different call set. Yes? Is it bad or would you recommend to use uh, exons that are easier to integrate that with the Yes, that's what I was saying. Yeah, you want to use the same experiment if possible. Same sequencer, same experiment. But it's not possible if it's not possible, then I, then you can't use VQSR really. I mean, you could, it, I mean, I'm not sure. You don't want to get all of your variants filtered because they were different than the, than the samples that you were adding. So I would do hard filtering as much as you can and hope for the best. Um, right, so similar te uh, technical generation. Um, it's all written here. Technology capture, read length, depth, etc. You want to match. Um, right, so if you have you have 1,000 genome samples that you want to add, what you do not want to do is uh, look, get their VCF as it is, add your VCF to it, and then filter that. That's not going to work. You need to have, you need to actually download their BAMs and run it through them. So you don't have to use all 1,000 all 1, BAMs of 1,000 genomes, but you can take 50 BAMs from 1,000 genomes and add them, okay? Assuming, of course, that the technologies match. Um, okay, now the hard part is when there are no resources. So if it's non-human, resources are not very well curated. Remember, we need training data, we need sensitivity data, we need all this known and unknown. We need at least three different files uh, for doing this. Um, so we, I don't think that we actually provide uh, for non-human, but there might be some stuff out there. Uh, I think Mouse, for example, has several resources available and so on. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, RNA-seq, um, I don't think that we currently generate the, we don't work with that much cohorts of RNA. Uh, so RNA-seq is not, uh, in our um, filtering mentality right now, uh, although that might change. 
Um, if your cord is too small or no, no samples are available, then you probably can't use VQSR. Um, and so then there's a part of our um, documentation that talks about manual filtering or hard filtering. You could look at their examples and recommendations instead. All right, so that's recalibration. Um, I think we have a break now, and then afterwards we will talk about uh, genotype refinement. Um,